Do you, I, do you yes. want me to wear this or? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, we're just going to introduce our speaker today, Troy Beckham. So, he's a PhD candidate in environmental and occupational health at the University of Washington, a school of public health. He received his MS in environmental health and an MPA in environmental policy and management from the University of Washington. And his current work focuses on two overlapping lines of research. The first one being understanding the relationship between non-standard or precarious employment and health, the second one being characterizing the contribution of work in creating and perpetuating disparities in health across social health. All right. Thank you. Do I have a little clicker thing or should I just... Oh. Right. Sorry, I should have asked about that. It's yeah, okay. I'll just... All right. All right. Great to be here. Um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about some of the work we're doing on the area of precarious employment and approaching it from an occupational health perspective. <laughs> some high-level context is that this work is generally motivated by this sort of observation that technological, social, economic, political, macro-level trends are changing the nature of work and in particular the way we structure employment relationships. So I don't know if this is ever discussed, but you know, you'll hear conversations about the gig economy and, and uh, things like this, but um, generally people are worried that there's been kind of a shift away from stable, secure models of, of jobs towards more <laughs> flexible and competitive employment practices. And I started off from the perspective of these trends haven't really been adequately examined from a public health perspective, and in particular, trying to think about how the principles of occupational and environmental health might be uh, leveraged to look at uh, this idea. And, you know, the, at least from a quantitative analysis, analysis perspective, we need good measures of things, you know, to put in our epidemiology. And um, you can't really hang a pump on a worker and get a measurement of the character and quality of their employment relationship, right? So um, that's led me down a very social science-y path. And I'm going to talk a lot about sociological theory, and, and I even use some of their statistical approaches. Hopefully I don't go off the deep end here. But I think a unique aspect of my experience as a district uh, doing a PhD has been this idea that I, I come, I did eight years of chemical risk assessment and exposure assessment, and then I got really interested in this topic. And now I'm, you know, in this room I'm a social scientist. If I'm around social scientists, they'll go, eh, get warmer. Get warm. um, in particular, I want to introduce you to the construct of employment quality, which is what I used to do my empirical stuff. And I'm going to tell you about two studies that we've been working on. The first is using latent class analysis to look at patterns of employment in the U.S. That's my dissertation. And then something we've, we've done more recently is using multi-channel sequence analysis to try to look at trajectories of employment quality across a 20-year span. So it's pretty descriptive, and we can talk about sort of positives and negatives to these approaches as we go. There's a lot of ways to think about, get started in this conversation, but the idea about a standard employment relationship is kind of a key concept. So SER, which I'll, I'll say a lot, is this idea of a normative form of employment where it's kind of expectation of ongoing permanent employment, usually with like regularly scheduled full-time hours, working directly for one employee, and often it invokes this idea of adequate wages and benefits and protections as well. And there's a fear that, you know, it's coming de-standardized or the rise of non-standard employment. And the word standard here is a little problematic. It's a little bit ahistorical, right? This is kind of hearkening back to good old days in post-World War II. Folks that were experiencing this type of employment were mostly white men, you know, it's not like the labor market was better in, in, in a lot of ways. And then, of course, in the 1800s, all work was precarious, if you, if you want to go there. But anyway, it's a useful sort of concept as a benchmark or an alloy gold standard to kind of compare with contemporary employment. And so um, that's kind of a key feature that I want to highlight. So a quick um, 
editorial on my part about why I think the term or the concept of precarious employment has been gaining traction within public health. So precarious employment really comes out of uh, social science critiques of modern capitalism and in, in my reading in particular this idea that risk was being shifted away from sort of market <coughs> entities and, and to a certain extent governmental bodies onto individuals, you know, such that life was becoming more insecure and precarious. And I think within occupational health in the last several decades, um, and maybe this is getting back to kind of its roots in social medicine, but away from a strictly engineering kind of industrial hygiene approach, but we're starting to think about the fact that, you know, the material and social conditions of workers outside of work have big impacts for worker health and thinking about, you know, how to promote, say, uh, worker health. And so we've been thinking a little bit in a more social determinants of health way, in my opinion. Um, so you see things like the U.S. NIOSH's total worker health, have people heard of that? So it's just trying to get a little bit more cognizant in a multi-level way of thinking. And so combined with this kind of very visible change in employment. I think the precarious employment concept is really appealing. But how do we integrate, actually integrate it into health research is another question. And my take is I think I've identified kind of one of the main tensions, um, which is that if you read some of the best sort of most influential thinkers on precarious employment, precarious employment really is a multi-dimensional uh, or multi-level phenomenon. It really, so your employment, the type of employment you have is really important, but the, the experience of precariousness is going to really depend on sort of your own susceptibility and policy context. So if you, if you say have a, t a temporary job, but you have a million dollars in the bank, then maybe you're not going to feel much job insecurity compared to somebody with limited sort of economic opportunities. And that's basically obviously correct, right? I mean, this is, this is the rich, richness that a, an intersectional approach or a multi-level approach would bring. And um, so I think, you know, all, all of the social science on this is really good, but in occupational health, we're really focused on job conditions, right? We want to know what are the job conditions and how is that impacting worker health? So we, I think one thing from the outset is that there's many levels to think about precarious employment, but we're, we're really focused at the level of the employment relationship. So this is a conceptual model I helped develop with some occupational epidemiologists in the EU. And it's trying to kind of lay that out. What is precarious employment from an occupational health perspective? So antecedent to the employment relationship is globalization, neoliberalism, and these big things. That's not precarious employment. That's, that's, those things lead to the way that we structure employment. Then downstream of the employment relationship are things like worse working conditions, the experience of precariousness, material deprivation. That's, that is related to, but causally downstream of the concrete way that the, the terms and conditions of your employment are structured. And then, of course, we need to think about policy context and social context, potentially moderating or, potent, or mediating that relationship. But um, so this is like a reductionist approach that sort of social scientists might scoff at. But I think for the purposes of epidemiology, we need to be clear about uh, these different things. So I, that hopefully wasn't too far off the reservation, but that gives you a little bit of, uh, of some context. And when we start to think more about the, the health evidence that makes us suspicious that we should be looking at employment quality, um, some of the early evidence does come from things like job insecurity. So that's a, often a subjective measure, but uh, the health evidence is very clear. That's not good for your health to feel like your job, you know, you're insecure. And, and we have quite good decades of epidemiology on that, then, then we started thinking about, well, if we can get more objective, maybe we should look at non-permanent contracts, because we feel like those would be more insecure. And, and those, too, have been linked to various health outcomes, including things like injury rates, and, but also mental health and, and other stuff. But there's a lot of things that are associated with health that are also dictated by the terms of the employment con 
contracts. So when and how long you work and when, uh, schedules, uh, wages, benefits. So an active area, if we're going to do good epidemiology, we need to come up with sort of multi-dimensional conceptualizations and measures for this. And basically, it took me 10 slides to get what, to what my uh, dissertation is about. And to do so without giving you any more context, I find that the employment quality construct is really useful. And one of the reasons I think it's really useful is because it can be readily integrated into an occupational health framework. And so when I think about trying to advocate for this, I am speaking to uh, my tribe. And I think uh, hopefully this will resonate. But um, the first thing is that we distinguish between work quality and employment quality. So work quality, that's the nature of work tasks and actual physical and social environment in which work takes place. In other words, what we've been doing in occupational health and safety forever. You know, we're good at this. We've been doing great. We add to the picture the idea that the terms and conditions of the employment relationship are also potentially important for worker health. So things like the type of contract, material benefits, hours and schedule, mobility opportunities, and then various ways of thinking about power relations, which we all sort of know is important in occupational health, but is often really left out of our analyses. Um, together, you know, you can, this, this kind of comes from this burgeoning literature on job quality, but, um, you know, we're, we're occupational health scientists, and if we're just focused on work quality, we might be leaving uh, something on the table that's relevant to um, our analysis. To get a little bit more concrete about how to operationalize employment quality. I'm using this, this conceptual framework that comes out of the European Union and it, it's the structural and relational aspects of the employment relationship as determined by seven specific dimensions. So stability, material rewards, rights and social protections, working time arrangements, training and employability opportunities, and then power relations at both kind of a collective and interpersonal level. And so you can see there's kind of structural, when do you work, how much do you get paid, and then there's kind of more relational stuff. And obviously, um, the relational stuff is a little bit more difficult to integrate in a satisfying way into uh, epidemiology, but nevertheless, we persist. Um, so this concept has been used and associated with health uh, first in the EU, and, and we were the first to do it in the, the US. So we have some limited studies that, that show that this construct is useful in sorting out uh, health among workers. And so, as I alluded to, I, I think it's useful to spend a little time thinking about this within the occupational health framework, and I am sort of rooted in that and feel strongly that it's a useful, a useful framework. So, if this is what we usually focus on, you know, chemical and physical hazards and psychosocial hazards for like occupational health psychologists. Again, we're adding, we're adding this employment quality feature. So let me try to make a case for why employment quality might affect the physical and chemical uh, exposures that we're used to saying. So you can imagine two workers doing the same work. One is a, a permanent worker, an SCR worker. Another is a temp agency worker. So that temp agency worker might get less or worse training. You know, the employer, employee, employer is less invested in them. They might be hiring them to do dangerous work so that they limit their sort of workers' compensation liability. I don't know how the Canadian system is. Probably better than ours. But um, you can imagine them be less integrated into social networks of workers where site-specific hazard information is transferred. Um, all, I think there are several ways that you can think about how employment arrangement itself confers differential risk. Then, of course, psycho psychological stress, you know, in insecurity, unfairness, feelings of powerlessness, those are all strong stressors. And then if you're thinking about things like wages and, and material, other benefits, material awards, clearly that has an impact for the material conditions of the worker. So this material deprivation pathway is added to the picture. Um, so. It's expanding the scope of things, but I think, hopefully I've convinced you that it kind of fits in with our normal way of thinking about job uh, to health. And uh, an important sort of 
lens that I try to bring into my work, and it's kind of hard to ignore when you're on this topic, but we, we have very good evidence that labor markets are stratified across social lines. Uh, and in this case, uh, it's very clear that these sort of different forms of employment are um, over, uh, this traditionally marginalized populations are overrepresented in these forms of work, including women, people of color, immigrants, younger, uh, lower skilled, lower educated. And so uh, in my mind, I think that the way that we structure employment relationships might be sort of a proximal cause that it helps explain social gradients in health. And that's been kind of uh, an important piece of my work. So. One last bit of context, which is measurement approaches. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of different ways that we can operationalize a multi-dimensional contract. So you imagine back to those seven dimensions. Say I had one item that described all seven of those dimensions. I could create a scale where I, you know, high to low employment quality. I can fit every single person on a continuum of high to low. That's the way we normally do epidemiology. We use these dimensional approaches that are kind of high to low. I am using a different approach, which I'll call a typological measurement approach. And this kind of assumes that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the concept in the population that you're studying. And um, it's emphasizing the distribution of kind of simultaneously occurring things. So a clustering approach is kind of like a typological approach. And there's kind of positives and negatives, um, and, but I just want to flag that. So if, if things, um, I, I'm often, in, in these two analyses, I'm looking for patterns. Uh, that was not my best version of describing that slide, but let's jump into the first study, uh, which is, in some cross-sectional data looking at patterns. I looked at the, um, the US General Social Survey. It's a nationally representative survey of American adults. And for the last uh, five waves, it's included this quality of work life module that NIOS developed. And it has really rich information on work and employment conditions. And I have about 7,400 uh, uh, workers in that sample, and I, I actually looked at wage earners and self-employed separately. And I found 11 items in this survey that kind of fit within my uh, EQ construct. So I tried to make them more objective than subjective. So for something like employment stability, instead of looking at a job security insecurity indicator, I looked at contract type. But I, if you look through here, you know, it's hard to get super objective, be a super, find super objective indicators. Uh, so some are likely to be more subjective. Um, and then what I do is I take those 11 indicators and I put them into a latent class analysis. And what that does is it identifies patterns, basically. Latent subgroups, so latent basically means unobservable. And so it's it's basically a clustering approach, but without getting too weedsy about the statistics, it's a model-based approach. So instead of classifying people into discrete clusters, it gives you a probability of being in all clusters. Um, and it has fit statistics to, to allow us to kind of find the, the best fitting model. But here's maybe one thing that is different than a lot of occupational exposure assessment experiences where there is this substantive interpretation and, and this is where theory really becomes important. And I can talk a little bit more about that, but the short version would be it's kind of science and art here. You know, it's like what makes sense and, and um, I think that that is something that I've gotten criticized or, or differences of culture uh, within our field uh, with the comfort level of that. Um, I kind of talked about this, but but since I'm looking at patterns of the way that employment is structured, we, we're going to expect that there's a lot of heterogeneity. So that's why a typological approach is probably useful. And then if you think about 
uh, a worker's experience in a job, it's probably not just how many sort of low quality attributes do you have, but actually kind of the particular configuration of those. Uh, all right. So this is a latent class analysis, I would say is a real data presentation challenge, as, as is my next example. But just to give you a flavor, it spits out what, what's called uh, conditional probability. So on the top here, um, we found eight distinct classes of employment quality, including the SER type and then various patterns. And then on the uh, y-axis, if you will, are the 11 indicators. And each of those numbers in the, in the heat map represents that given your membership in a certain class is the probability that you experience that uh, variable. So, for instance, in the SER uh, employment quality group, you have a 93% chance of having a regular permanent job. And so, without going into detail through all of this, you can see that uh, when you look at the columns, that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity, right? So the, the darker the shade, the more likely you are having a high quality employment quality attribute. And so the SER looks pretty dark, and then we have this group called Portfolio, and they're, they're standard, but they make a lot of money, and they work a lot of hours, and they have a lot of control. And then we have various sort of patterns thereof, including one that I'm calling precarious, which you can see is fairly light. There's a lot of white there. So I'm just kind of one showing you that LCA data is hard to, <laughs> hard to present and B that there's a lot of heterogeneity. So this might be a little bit easier to think about um, where I've just kind of verbally described uh, the differences. But I want to point out that the first four employment quality types are all what you might consider standard if you were just looking at contract type and kind of hours. They're full-time, they're permanent, but they really differ in, differ in the experience of the worker, potentially. So I mentioned portfolio. They're doing great, but they work a lot. But then we have this, these other, other forms of standard employment where they, they either have no control over their work hours or no feeling of opportunity. Um, so the kind of multi-dimensional typological approach is suggesting here that there's a lot more heterogeneity and we can't just rely on things like contract type. Then um, there's a couple in the wage earners, there's two versions of precarious employment. So there's one which is kind of an accumulation of all poor quality attributes and then there's this one that seems like if I was judging them that they would be a very precarious employment relationship, but they feel pretty good about it. They're okay with it. And I think for now I'll just not talk too much about the self-employed folks because there's a kind of a whole nother uh, ball of wax there. So if we look at associations with health, so I, I did a, a kind of a simple regression here. Um, looking at self-reported health, a measure of frequent mental distress, and occupational injury experience. And you can see that A, employment quality is associated with health, and that B, the association with health kind of differs depending on the pattern. So that those portfolio workers are similar, or maybe a little bit better. And then um, the precarious workers, I would expect that they were going to have worse health. but then there's some different sort of interesting patterns going on as well. So the, the optimistic precarities are low wage, non-standard non arrangements with low hours. They have similar health to our SER type. And they also happen to feel like they have power over their schedule and feel optimistic about the future, etc. Then we have this dead-end job who actually makes more money than the SER. They have full-time but not excessive hours. They have permanent contracts, but they feel like they have a really low opportunity to advance, they have poor power relations, they get harassed, they don't, they don't feel like they have control over anything, and they report worse on all three of the health indicators. So again, 
this approach, which is complicated to describe, and I don't know how well I'm doing it, <laughs> um, is finding that there are the patterns here are fairly complicated if you invite the complexity of looking at a, a, a sort of rich conceptual framework. And so um, then we looked at kind of social and a few job correlates as well. And the results were fairly intuitive for my <coughs> mental model of the US. Um, in other words, things like the precarious employment class tended to be younger, female, people of color, immigrants, low education in the service sector. And then these privileged, this privileged class of worker were older white guys with high education and in management and IT jobs. And so um, overall, the employment quality construct seems to be somewhat useful in both differentiate, differentiating patterns of employment arrangements and sorting folks by health and, and social correlates. But it's just a snapshot in time in this, in this cross-sectional data set, right? And for, for example, in the optimistic precarious group, they tended to be a little bit younger. So you can imagine you're a low paid intern, but you sort of have your career ahead of you and you're feeling good. And even though your job might look precarious, you might feel okay about your future. Um, so what we wanted to do is try to see, could we take this concept of employment quality with all its richness and descriptive power and see if we could apply it to a more longitudinal way of thinking. And this turns out to be pretty challenging and, and I offer you one potential example. And to do so, we uh, use the panel survey of income, income dynamics, which is uh, a pretty well-known and often studied uh, survey that includes kind of economic, social, and health measures. Um, we ended up using, being able to use data from 1985 to 2017. Um, one interesting thing is you, you start with a representative sample in 1968 and then they follow the descendants of those families as well. Um, not really relevant to our analysis, but it's a cool data set. Well, we wanted to look, we wanted to look at a, a lot of years and we want, and, and the method we used was very sensitive to missing data. So we, we had to use somewhat uh, restrictive inclusion criteria. So it's kind of shocking, but we, we went from 32,000 individuals to two to almost 3,000 individuals. And um, I can talk more about that. It ended up that the, the I, what I'm getting at is that would be kind of scary from a, from a generalizability perspective. But we, in, we did look at the folks that we excluded and they looked fairly similar, slightly lower SES. Um, but the method is very sensitive. This multi-channel sequence analysis is very sensitive to missing data. So basically, folks with a lot of missingness would just get clustered together. And that's why we needed this 90% observable data. And it ended up that we weren't able to use very much of our data set. So we got to look at you know, what are the implications of, of having such strict uh, inclusion criteria. Um, to operationalize EQ, in the PSID, we, we were able to use six different indicators. So uh, for stability, they weren't as good. They weren't as rich in, overall as the general social survey. But for a measure of stability, we did unemployment in the last year. We had income level. We had uh, employer provided insurance as sort of a benefit, uh, much more important in the US context. Uh, working hours, union representation, and, and self-employment status is sort of an imperfect uh, power relation proxy, and I'm happy to talk more about that if you want. But we could only get this information if you were currently employed. So um, if you were self-employed, not in the labor force, or unemployed, then that was a separate, a separate state uh, that you could also be in. So sequence analysis approach is trying to characterize trajectories uh, in other words, sequences of discrete states. And what it does is it creates a 
this similarity matrix based on the cost it would take to transform one sequence into another sequence to make it identical. And the way that it does that, I'll try to, I'll try to explain. This is the first time I've ever said these words out loud. <laughs> um, so say we have three individuals and we're just talking about one variable right now and that's union representation. And so we have five years or five follow-up periods and individual one is a union in every, the state that they're in is union representation in every state. Individual two, there's their union except for in the third follow-up, they're non-union. So one substitution has to take place in that case to make them <laughs> identical. And then individual three is also union except for one year where they're not in the labor force. And when you calculate the so what it's doing is it's saying how similar is individual one to individual two and individual one to individual three. And so individual three would have a higher cost because it's less likely in our data to go from union to not in the labor force than it is from union to non-union. Anyway, so the substitution idea, I hope I've explained the idea that we're looking at sequences of states. That's kind of the most important part. But then there's this other cost about um, you know, what, how different is the state uh, within each wave. And then you, after you create this matrix of cost, then you do a cluster analysis to group uh, individuals that were really, they were most similar. And what a multi-channel sequence analysis is doing is it's doing that for multiple variables uh, at the same time. And so this is really sort of complicated to explain. Um, but so what we're doing in this case, instead of having just one state, it's a multi-state sequence. So I'm just, I'm doing six, but let's just do two for now. So you're union and you're in the third court income quartile. And so all of these folks are union and in the third income quartile. But then, you know, individual one moves to the fourth income quartile. So now they're different again. So anyway, you can imagine it's, it's doing more than one variable at the same time, basically. And so the advantage between, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of social science work that uses sequence analysis, but often it's just one variable at a time. And in this space, it would be something like whether or not you were employed or in the labor market. And so we're doing something much more richer and potentially useful, but also complicated. And this is the output that we get. Again, forgive me, this will be the first time I've explained it. But let's, let's say that we have, we have our five, five variables. And on the x-axis is the 20 years. And the, the shading gives us an indication to the character of the trajectory in each variable. So, and, and I guess one, one other thing I'll say is the lighter the color, the higher quality the attribute. So let's try to walk through this together. Just looking at employer health insurance, this, this, this color means that you have employer provided health insurance. And you can see that for this group, which is called SER like non-union, they pretty much have health insurance a high percentage the entire time. You see a, a, a kind of variability in income levels. They're pretty much all non-union, which is what that dark green color. You see differences in hours, and then you see that basically they were they they didn't have unemployment in the past year. So that's how we get a sense of the character of this trajectory. This is an SER job that's not represented by union, but they have benefits. They have sort of a range of wages and normative hours. This is the, the second and third quartile of hours. So they're kind of in the middle of the hours. Compare that to a SER union job. So switching back, look at just the union one. So this is all dark green, that means non-union. I mean pretty much everything is the same except for 
they're more likely to be in a union and their wages are higher. So here's the second cluster we found. And again, this is like the challenge and the fun of, of <laughs> trying to lay theory on top of a data-driven typological measurement approach. So again, almost nothing changes. They're both working similar numbers of hours, roughly, they, just the income and the, and the union status. And then the next one is this sort of high-level managerial prof professional type. And what's changing here is, again, it's going back to non-union, but look at the wage, the wage distribution is this light color, which is the top quartile of income. And they also work more hours, it looks like. So hopefully that gives you some anchor to evaluate the precarious trajectory. So you can see that for the first time in any of these trajectories, we have a sizable chunk of folks that don't have employer-provided health insurance. We also see that they are mostly working in low-wage jobs. They're not unionized. They have kind of low hours, and then this, this dark beige or tan bar is past year employment, and that's got to be you know, nearly 10% in any given year had unemployment in the past year. So in other words, the a holistic look of this trajectory suggests it conforms to kind of this idea of low wage work that's fairly unstable, low access to benefits, etc. I don't know, what do, what do people think? Is this interesting? <laughs> um, so again, we found eight different sort of types of trajectories. Uh, I didn't plan it that way, that we also found eight clusters in my <coughs> class analysis. I think, I think I'll not talk too much about the other ones, um, besides the four that we, we talked about, but uh, precarious employed folks had worse health, as did some some other smaller groups. Um, not all of them were so stable. There was kind of a becoming self-employed group. There was a returning to labor force group. Um, but again, we find differences in health and they basically conform to how we might a priori suspect them. That managerial group is doing great. They're doing, they're doing fine. And then again, we, we find a similar pattern where the folks that are actually experiencing these labor market trajectories conform to how uh, an unequal social distribution with highly educated white guys in this privileged class and uh, more traditionally marginalized social groups in the in the ones with worse health and uh, worse uh, employment quality trajectories. So I'll wrap up there by saying that I think the employment quality construct is potentially useful for us in occupational health to give a more holistic characterization of the impact of job on, on health. But we need new analytical frameworks. I'm not sure this is the best one. You know, the, the approaches that I've, that I've shown or even the, the theoretical framework, but it is true that we need to have folks that are kind of exploring options for us within occupational health and epidemiology. Um, I presented two approaches that are really rich, but and but they're mostly descriptive. And I think, you know, the question about how do we get more causally inferred analyses or, or more, more rigorous from a causal inference perspective is a, is a useful question. But I think we need to grapple with the complexity and heterogeneity. And I think this type of analysis does that. And generally, I would say employment quality is, is there's a lot of different patterns going on. It's basically associated. We've, we've shown, at least initially, that there's indication that it's associated with health and that there's a differential social distribution of employment quality. And so here I set up you know, the idea that employment quality might be kind of a proximal contributor to social gradients in health. That's it. Thank you very much, Trevor. That was very dense, but you, I, I, I think I followed. So um, <laughs> I'm going to let the remote audience take the time to type their questions. And it's, 
take a quick scan here in the room and see if there's anyone who has questions. Very educational. Uh, now I'll turn up to it. Yeah, it's my kind of, my kind of talk. Um, I, I think, I just want to emphasize, I guess, what I, I think you were trying to say, and, and what struck me is that the employment quality is tapping into something unique and different. Because what struck me in the talk is that the standard employment relationship is what we associate with good employment and better health was not capturing it, right? That there was something else. Either those jobs were not associated with better health, per se, by definition, or there was no observed relationship or where the action was happening. It's with other characteristics. So very striking to me and, and the data that employment quality is picking up on something distinct from the standard employment relationship. Mm -hmm. We tend to associate with good quality. Um, I'm curious with the first uh, analyses, um, I, I think you captured it in the second analyses, which was more longitudinal in terms of the age of onset of follow-up, but in the first data set, I'm always curious about a group of individuals who by definition have been precarious relationships early in life, but the school or, uh, uh, yeah, attending in school or just getting into the labor force, whether they were in your first analyses and how it might play out because sometimes precarious employment is part of early life experiences. Totally. Um, I, I think it's an, imp an important piece and one one thing that we're trying to be clear-eyed about. But yeah, when you look at uh, age as a correlate, you know, you see in particular that optimistic precarious. So like any, any conception of precarious employment would take this group, they would say you have a high probability of having a non-permanent contract, you have low wages, you have low hours, you have, you know, from a, from a fundamental perspective, you would, you would guess that that is not a beneficial employment arrangement. But for a young person, depending on their situation, so th that group was the one that really cued me into the need and the, and the shortcomings of a cross-sectional snapshot perspective. However, it, and, and also, this is more likely that younger folks are in what I labeled precarious. But we do know that there are middle and older aged folks that are in really crappy employment. And so the trajectories are showing that there are some folks that never get out of that track. And but it, it needs to be, it's important for any cross-sectional analysis to include that thinking, I think. I have a question for you um, with regard to this first analysis. Um, so you use the latent class analysis, which means that, and you said it yourself quite perfectly, which is it's a mix of the art and science. And so my understanding from um, latent class analysis is that you know you have this fit statistic that tells you how well your clustering fits the data, but also you decide how many clusters. And sometimes the fit statistic is very small, the differences are very small. So you could go with, you know, six, and you could go with eight, and have, um, you know, quantitatively speaking, not a huge difference. But you decide that eight is the way that's going to go. So how do you test how generalizable it is? And, and yeah. So it's interesting that you use the word test there. Um, so. Well said, you're totally right about the idea. So it is nice that latent class analysis provides you fit statistics because it can help you from, from a statistical perspective say this is what the model thinks is the best fit of the data. But then you have to go in there and you have to say does this make sense at all because this is a data-driven approach. So in our case, you know, the SER relationship, hey, it's great that we found that because that is a normative pattern of these variables that we would expect to find. And so one thing that was nice was, I, I don't remember exactly which four, but the model, the model said that the five class solution was the best. But it wasn't that different than the four, and one of the, one of the information criteria chose a seven, so we looked at four to seven, and it may be eight. And what happened was, Four of these guys popped right out, 
and then they kind of persisted across the five class model, across the six class model. And so that gave us an indication that the, that the clustering of those variables was meaningful. And, and then the other thing that was important was it, this is, it ended up being fairly similar to some European analyses with some important differences. But yeah, so you get fit statistics and then you have to literally go in to the models and say, what, what is this telling me from an interpretive interpretation perspective? And we had the luck, or not luck, uh, the benefit that the clusters were fairly stable across the different models. What happens is one model breaks into two usually, and then, you know, it's like, oh, I can see that cluster five and six were four in the last model, and that gives you confidence that you're, it's not just a local maxima, and it's like the five, if the six class solution, nothing was recognizable in the five class solution, then this approach should not be used, I think, because, you know what I mean? So, I could go on, but, but, it's, but it's uncomfortable from sort of a quanti quantitative science perspective to say, I get to choose what model, you know, and that's why it's really descriptive. It's, it's, this is a, a descriptive approach that I think informs more causal, causal inference-based epidemiology because we're, we get insight into sort of some of the shortcomings of different approaches that are not taking into account the richness. Great, thanks. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I'm just wondering what you think could be some of the policy implications of the findings. And you know, if we have a bunch of politicians in the room that would make changes at the workplace, what would you tell them? So on one hand, I, I'm kind of cynical about politics right now, but um, is that is it just me? No. Uh, on one hand, this is just supporting, like, we need to let, raise up basic sort of employment quality features like wages and other sort forms of social protection. I think that in these in these classes that are suffering from worse health than the SER model, it's, if we made them more like an SER model, then if you take this at face value, then that might improve their health. But a different, a, a different way of thinking about it that's sort of less obvious is to think that these sorts of conditions might be clustering in certain ways and in certain groups. But when we usually enact policy, it's kind of one thing at a time. So let's limit hours or something. You know? So with this, with this typological approach and, and finding that these things cluster together, it should bring a little bit of caution to just enacting single policies, which might help some groups, and even, but not others or even hurt others. So that's one thing, which is we need, I think we need to think in a little bit more targeted way. And then the other thing would be that we might be more targeted in terms of the populations that we are trying to help. So this suggests that, again, like other lines of evidence, that these low quality jobs are clustering into certain working populations. And therefore, you could think about sort of policy that might um, be targeted at the population level as well. I don't know, does that answer your question? It's not, yeah, it, I'll stop. Um, it is already two o'clock. I'm sure other people have a lot of questions. I do. Um, but we'll take, um, you're sticking around and we'll take around yeah. for those who have questions and want to have a discussion with you. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Trevor.